Father, I, I thought we were going to the annual meeting in the Society of Introverts. This is a little bit more than I was <laughs> expecting. Um, thank you so much, Father Charles, um, for this privilege, uh, for your leadership of the Catholic Information Center, for your friendship. It's been a real privilege to be a part of this great enterprise and uh, to be a friend, uh, to have you as a friend. Frank, uh, you, are, uh, you are basically my older brother, and um, uh, I can't thank you enough for your friendship and also for um, the many lessons that I've learned from you. Uh, I've learned a lot about prudence and um, right judgment, I said I've learned a lot about it. Haven't necessarily always practiced it, but I'm very grateful for um, for your counsel and your friendship. And it's great to see so many friends and familiar faces, and really great to see lots of people I don't know, <laughs> um, because uh, that says a lot about uh, what's happening here at the CIC. Uh, the work that Father Charles and Mitch and Cindy and the whole staff is doing. If there are people here that I don't know and some of you don't know, it means that there is some real evangelization occurring in this town and it's much needed. So it's a privilege to be here and it's, and it's a great privilege to receive this award. Though I do think the real honor this evening should go to the CIC, along with the Leonine Forum, which I think is a very important piece of our future. They're the cutting edge of the new evangelization. Few organizations are doing more to raise up a new generation of courageous and faithful Catholic men and women. The seeds that the CIC and the Leonine Forum have planted will sprout and bear fruit for many, many years. Now the board and Father Charles may be conferring this award on me, but it's really Father Charles, Mitch Borsma, and the CIC and Leonine team who deserve our gratitude. And I think we should thank them all for everything they've done. The new evangelization, of course, uh, began with the namesake of this award. Pope St. John Paul II rededicated the church to its timeless mission of proclaiming Christ to all peoples, as he put it in Redemptoris Missio. Under his faithful stewardship, the church ended its second millennium with great zeal and entered its third with great hope. Pope Benedict XVI defend, deepened the theological and, and intellectual underpinnings of the new evangelization, while Pope Francis has further broadened the church's outreach to the peripheries of the world. And many of you in this room, along with countless others, have carried the truth forward in your own ways and through your diverse work. The participation of the laity is the most important element of the new evangelization. Each of us is called to seek the kingdom of God by engaging in temporal affairs and orienting them in accordance with the will of God. In our particular work, we are supposed to spread the gospel to those we serve and through all that we do. This evangelizing work extends to every facet of life, including law, public policy, and politics, which are, are the areas that I know best. They need light and salt no less than any other field. And many here have long promoted a legal culture that respects and upholds the dignity of the human person. This work is an integral part of the new evangelization insofar as it reflects Catholic teaching, spreads Christ's message, and helps draw others closer to God and what he wants for us. Tonight we commemorate the new evangelization and hopefully we do that, at least in part, by committing ourselves more zealously and fully to its work. But no commemoration would be complete without acknowledging that Catholic evangelization faces 
extraordinary threats and hurdles. Our culture is more hateful and intolerant of Catholicism than at any other point in our lives. It despises who we are, what we profess, and how we act. Given this deep and broad hostility, there are some, perhaps even in this room, who fear a dwindling capacity to evangelize successfully. But that fear is misplaced. Formidable threats to evangelization are nothing new, and they have never been cause for despondency then or now. The Catholic experience throughout history should give us hope that evangelization is eminently possible and indeed increasingly urgent. Now, lest we think that our future is grim, it's worth reminding ourselves of the challenges Catholicism has faced and overcome thanks to the piety and actions of the faithful. In 1683, Christendom was on the brink of a massive rollback in its reach and influence. The Ottoman Empire, led by Sultan Mehmed IV and a series of bloodthirsty grand viziers, brutally expanded the grip of Muslim rule into Europe. They had captured the Aegean Islands from Venice and expanded their boundaries to the north through Transylvania and parts of Poland. Yet their ultimate goal was to capture Vienna. They realized that because of the city's location, its occupation could lead to the conquest of Western Europe and the defeat of Christianity itself. The Muslims laid siege to Vienna on September 11th with an army of more than 400,000. By comparison, at its peak, the combined force of the Holy Roman Empire and the Kingdom of Poland numbered a mere 70,000. Despite this incredible imbalance, Catholicism prevailed. Thanks to the heroic efforts of King John Sobieski of Poland and his troops, the Muslim forces were turned back and they suffered the biggest defeat of the Ottoman Empire in centuries. It was the end of the Muslim expansion into Europe and as King Sobieski said, we came, we saw, God conquered. Now skip ahead 100 years to the terrible period of 1789 to 1801 in France. The fate of the church seemed nearly as grim. The revolutionary leadership appropriated church property, designated Catholic priests as employees of the state, destroyed statues, icons, crucifixes, and church bells, banned religious holidays, and took control of Catholic Church birth, death, and marriage roles. In a matter of years, the radical government managed to exile 30,000 Catholic priests and killed hundreds of priests and nuns in mass exterminations. Any priest who refused to take an oath of loyalty and subordination to the state, and anyone who harbored such a priest was subject to death on sight. Now surely to the lay Catholic then, it looked as if the church's days in France were numbered. But that wasn't the case. France is a classic illustration of G.K. Chesterton's observation that Christianity has died many times and risen again, for it had a God who knew the way out of the grave. <laughs> Not only did French Catholicism survive the revolutionary years, it is now undergoing something of a revival in our own day and age. Among French youth between the ages of 18 and 30, there has been a resurgence in Catholic affiliation. Previously, hardly a third of young Frenchmen were identifying themselves as Catholic. Now, more than half are. There has also been an explosive growth in non-parish Catholic lay movements 
that has allowed high-intensity Catholics to live in and not apart from the world. Vocations to the priesthood are still anemic, but since 2015, ordinations have generally increased, not decreased, leading to a growing number of priests between the ages of 30 and 40 years. And amongst the politically active, there is a marked increase in Catholic identity. That includes a growing number of Catholic commentators in the secular media, greater opposition to government efforts to regulate Catholic schools, and significant opposition to same-sex marriage. Now, Catholics I know in France remain concerned about the future, but they are more optimistic and hopeful than at any other point in recent memory. Finally, Catholicism in America has survived and thrived despite periods of persecution. In the early 1920s, we faced horrifying threats from the KKK. The Klan had attracted millions of members, and their goal was summed up well by an editorial from one of the organization's many periodicals. Drop not your fiery cross, but carry it over vale and hill till pagan Roman Catholicism is expelled from our fair and free American life forever. The KKK didn't just use words. They conducted well-known cross burnings. Together with many anti-Catholic allies, they passed countless laws discriminating against Catholic schools while conducting massive marketing campaigns pushing for discrimination in the hiring of Catholic workers. There was even the occasional murder of a priest. When a Birmingham, Alabama priest was murdered by a Klansman, Klan member and future Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black defended him and secured an acquittal from the Klansman judge and jury. For millions of Catholics, the 1920s made it seem like the church could, in fact, be driven from American public life. But the Klan failed miserably. A hundred years later, Catholicism has not just endured, but expanded. In fact, the number of American Catholics has grown from 18 million to at least 72 million. A majority of the Supreme Court and a large number of prominent public officials are faithful mass attending Catholics. Nationwide, irrepressible Catholic advocacy has led to a dramatic expansion of religious freedom and conscience rights. And at the community level, Catholic schools remain the backbone of education for many minorities in almost all our big cities. While the church is absolutely indispensable to ensuring a safety net for our country's poor and other most vulnerable. All this and more, just one century after the Klan sought to drive American Catholicism into hiding, if not out of existence. The historical record proves that God is faithful to his people. We should be confident that he will guide and guard us as we pursue the new evangelization amid rising opposition and persecution. No question, Catholicism faces vile and immoral current day barbarians, secularists, and bigots. These barbarians can be known by their signs. They vandalized and burnt our churches after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. They show up at events like this one trying to frighten and muzzle us. From coast to coast, they are conducting a coordinated and large-scale campaign to drive us from the communities they want to dominate. Similarly, there are the current day secularists, and they are just as myopic and ignorant as their counterparts from earlier ages. They twist the natural understanding that religion can coexist alongside secular institutions, and they deny the truth that the two can strengthen each other. They seek to have our forums censored or canceled, and seek to have us fired from our jobs, or excluded from the public square if we do not swear loyalty to woke ideologies. They're fine with Catholics, as so long as we draw the curtains at home and keep it in the pews. 
Finally, there are the current day bigots, the progressive Ku Klux Klan. They spread false and slanderous rhetoric about Catholic apostolates and institutions like the one represented here tonight. They mock our practices and devotions. They repeat the KKK canard that Catholics want this country dominated and controlled by a theocracy, which no well-informed Catholic should ever support. And if you happen to be a particularly prominent Christian, they intimidate and harass you outside your home and in restaurants and stores with the express purpose of driving you into social and professional exile. These barbarians, secularists, and bigots have been growing more numerous over the past few years. They control and use many levers of power. Yet, even so, we cannot lose hope in the ultimate success of the new evangelization. With God, all things are possible, and he has equipped us to carry out this mission, no matter how impossible it may seem. As we prepare for this hard yet necessary task ahead, I urge us to remember three things. First, the threats to the new evangelization are not of flesh and blood. This is spiritual warfare. Our opponents are not just uninformed or unchurched. They are often deeply wounded people whom the devil can easily take advantage of. He has hardened their hearts and closed their minds, which means reason alone will not win this struggle. Prayer and reparations are urgently and powerfully important. For it's God alone who can cut through Satan's lies and free the people he has enslaved. Secondly, we need to be joyful and hopeful, like the Blessed Virgin Mary. From what she was told before and within two months of Christ's birth, and from what she, and from what she knew through scripture, Mary was well aware of the fate of her son. And yet we know from the gospel passages about the wedding feast at Cana that Mary invited Jesus to begin his ministry, his journey to Calvary. If Mary could show such hope and joy, surely we can too. After all, in the scheme of things, we face far less consequential challenges. Finally, we need to educate ourselves about the true nature of the new evangelization. That includes reaching the right answer to the following question. How does Catholicism interact with the American experiment in self-government? Liberty enhances the ability of human beings to choose virtue and pursue a deeper union with God. And liberty is at the core of the American system of constitutional self-government. This means that as we strive to win hearts and minds for Christ, we should not seek to impose our faith or have it enforced by the power of the state. Just the opposite. We must respect the freedom that God has granted to his creation to pursue and love him freely. Sadly, some Catholics have embraced theories that run counter to this truth, such as illiberalism and integralism. People who espouse these theories sometimes seek to erect a modern state that not only acknowledges the higher duty that each person has to God, but compels virtue to such a degree that people actually no longer have the free will necessary to seek and receive grace. Yet what we owe to God is not rightly dictated by the state. Indeed, history teaches that confessional states, even when governed by supposedly faithful Catholics, have often clashed with church leaders, seeking to bring them under their control, 
or to use religion for their own political ends. And what is past is surely prologue. Who can doubt that supposedly Catholic politicians might be tempted to exploit their, exploit their faith for their own political purposes? Faithful Catholics cannot fall prey to these temptations. We must remember that the rightful power of the state is, lo- is limited not only from below by the individual rights of its citizens, but also from above, since government does not have the authority to determine what man owes to God. It would be foolish for us to place this power in the hands of our elected leaders, no matter how moral they may seem and no matter how immoral society may be. Now, to be sure, elected and political branches of government should strive to adopt sound and virtuous laws. The law is a teacher, and our republic needs a virtuous citizenry to preserve our liberties. But in the end, our salvation will not come from human lawmakers. We must depend on God's gift of grace by which he makes fruitful the work we do in our families, our communities, and civil society. In the end, the renewal of our culture will for the most part come from the bottom up, not from the top down. That is true evangelization, and it is already underway thanks to many of you in this room. There is perhaps no more appropriate example than the CIC and the Leonine Forum, and there are so many other apostolates in the Catholic world. They are achieving great things, and in the last decade alone, they have grown in size, number, and most importantly, impact in the lives of our fellow Americans. Now is the time to amplify our support for apostolates and the hard work of individual conversion and social renewal. This is what the new evangelization demands. And I have faith that together we will carry it forward and once again lift the eyes of America upward toward Christ. Thank you again for the privilege of this award and thank you for your work to proclaim Christ in new and renewed ways.